But for all, everybody who is in class today is going to win a $10,000 bonus prize. <laughs> um, so it's all, it's too bad for you unlucky people who didn't show up. But um, yeah, so today we're going to do uh, the EM algorithm, uh, the expectation. Do you have any questions or about, uh, uh, are you guys, uh, the exam is on Friday. And um, uh, and um, let me see. You're doing the labs, right? How are the labs coming along? I probably, you know, this is where I really prefer paper. Actually, I have to go look at your labs, organize them, and um, uh, yeah, and, and, and review them. Uh, so, are there any questions on the labs? Have you implemented yet the uh, lab with the non-Gaussian prior? Uh, I'm going to be moving next week to the end of the test. So. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'll be just spending the working on that. Well, okay. Right, right, right. Did you do the Gaussian prior? Uh, yeah. You didn't do either? Uh, no, I've done a few parts of that. Like, okay. 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 So we're still working on the homework. Yeah. So I will tell you what, doing the lab will, might help you with the exam. Maybe uh, it's running a little short, but okay. But everybody's uh, kind of okay. And then there's actually another lab that's on clustering. So that'll be, you don't want to get too far behind on the lab because they, well, first of all, it's hard to catch up. But the other thing is that um, it really doesn't give you insight into the material. The reason I had to do the lab, if you actually understood the ideas, well, there's two reasons I had to do the lab. One is to get practice programming. But the other is that when you actually do it, I think you understand it much better. Okay, so. All right, so maybe I'll go to the uh, EM algorithm at this point. Um, so we started introducing the EM algorithm. The, EM al the concept of the al EM algorithm is very important because there's many applications in which there's missing information when you're trying to do an estimation problem. Where if you had had more information, it'd be easier to estimate. So like, for instance, if I'm like trying to estimate the average gray level of uh, say this little square thing here, okay? Okay. So I really need, in order to estimate the average gray scale of the square thing, I need to know where the square thing is, right? So if I put a window, like a, a real big window around it, then I get a really bad average, okay? I could pick a really small one, but then that wouldn't be right either. So you have an ink, if some, now if an oracle comes to you and tells you where this gray scale, this gray thing is, okay? then of course that makes it easy. But usually you don't have oracles to tell you such things. So you have what's called nuisance information. You have to find the location of the object as well as estimated mean. You can't do both. Okay, I mean, well, I mean you have to do both. But typically you don't have one of the measurements is not direct. Okay, so you have incomplete information. There's a lot of, oh my God, what happened here? There's a lot of cases there's a lot of cases in which you have incomplete information in real problems where um, and it comes up particularly often in like pattern recognition problems what people will call pattern recognition, unsupervised learning, computer vision um, where there's some missing piece of information. So, um, so you have to simultaneously, now you have to simultaneously estimate the piece of missing information and determine the thing you really want to know. And the problem is, is that it could be a self-fulfilling um, prophecy. You know, it's like you can get, you can, you can, your, your estimate can be really far off because of your assumptions, right? So if you want to, if you, you want to say, you know, I, I want to find out how much smarter produced children are than the general population, right? But I don't have a labeled list of produced students. So I just take all the smart students, right, and I say, well, they must be produced students. And then I find they're smarter. And then I go back and find even smarter students. So I mean, it's, it's obviously a circular reasoning process, right, where I'm associating produced students with smart students, and then I'm determining that they're smart, OK? Well, it's unfair. You're going to get a biased estimate. In fact, it's not even just a biased estimate. It's an inconsistent estimate, because no matter how much data I have, I'm still going to get the wrong answer. Okay, so um, so this is a problem, and it comes up a lot. Okay, so.
So how do we solve this? So you might say, well, it's just impossible to do. I can't both estimate which students are produced students and estimate the average intelligence of the produced students at the same time. Well, you can. Of course, there's always going to be some error in your estimates, but you can have a much better estimate, okay? Uh, so let me go to the, uh, it, it's almost magic, really. I mean, the EM algorithm is magic. Uh, so the way it works is this. So you have a probability distribution, right? So you have, uh, you have y, so that's the observed data. And you have x, this is unobserved data. Right? And how you want to, um, and, and you have a model, okay? So you have, some joint distribution of y and x. Typically, and, and then there's some unknown parameters, beta, okay, that you want to estimate. So theta might be the mean or maybe the variance of x. It can also be the probability, uh, I'm sorry, it, it could be the mean and variance of each class of, of y. So x here might, it might be discrete, like it's 0 and 1. You're a produced student and you're not a produced student, right? And and why is is your intelligence, okay? Well maybe okay, maybe this is a bad analogy. I'll say your your height, okay? We'll say produced students are taller, okay? Okay? So it's your height, okay? So you're measuring uh, the the height of each student and you say, Well, produced students are taller. So first, I'll say, but I lost the mapping which tells me which students are from Purdue. So I, I had a big camp out of students, and they all mixed together, and they were keeping a secret, and they wouldn't tell me which of them were Purdue students. So if I take all the tall students, and I say they must be Purdue students, well, of course I'm going to get the wrong estimate of, of how tall they are, right? So, so the picture is like this. You have two populations, right? So one population has a distribution like that, and the other population has a distribution like that, right? So how do I both set them? But now what happens is I, I look at the distribution of the combined population, and it kind of looks like this. Okay? So what do I do? Well, I could say, well, okay, that's probably a classifier. It's better than nothing. And then I'll say, well, that's population one, and that's population two. But obviously, the estimates I'm going to get for the mean are going to be totally off, right? Because the distribution of the mean I get will be like over here, right? Okay? When the true mean should have been here, okay? So, is the information just lost? I mean, you lost information. You can't do as well. Ideally, you'd like to know for each y, yn is the, the value here, right? Okay, for each for each n, y n is the value, and x n is going to be either say zero or one, depending upon whether it comes from class zero or class one. So if I know x and y, if I have both, then I can estimate the mean. It's quite easy. In that case, uh, mean zero say will be the sum, right, over y n such that x n equals equals zero, right? And then divide it by, I'll call it n zero, which is the number of entries in that class, right? So basically, another way I can write that is I can say, okay, this is going to be the sum from n equals one to n, if there are n samples, right? And then I take y n times delta of x n minus zero, because right? so You'll add a term y and x and zero, but if it's not zero, you'll just leave it out. And then this thing here will be over n zero. And uh, and by the way, n zero is just the sum from n equals one to n of uh, delta of x n minus zero. Does that make sense? So this just sums all the x's that are zero, right? And this just takes the sum of all the y's where the x is zero. And this computes then the mean. So that, that would be a good estimate of the mean. The problem is I don't know x. 
If I knew x, it's easy to calculate the mean. Does this, 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 is this clear? Yeah. So, okay, so x here, each x is, tells you whether it's, you have a series of these x, y pairs, right? So you have a series of x, y pairs, so it's y, n, x, n, for n equals 1 to n. And for each pair, x is the label. It's either 0, 1, and it tells you it's either from class 0 or class 1. And then y is the value. So it's the height, okay? So for each student, I have a thousand students in a room. For each student, I can tell you it's 0, it's not Purdue student. 1, it is Purdue student. Well, uh, y sub n is the height of the student. Now if I do the distribution of the whole group is sort of modeled together, but if I did the distribution of each group separately, I see that the Purdue students on, on average were taller, okay? Because they spent more time playing football or something. I don't know, for some reason, okay? We fertilized them more. They took more vitamins, okay? We praised them, okay? And that increased their self-esteem and then they, their blood pressure went up and they got more oxygen to their brain and they got taller. So this is what happens, okay? Now, so does this, is this clear? This is really simple, but what I'm really introducing here is the notation, because we're going to use this notation, so I want you to start getting familiar with it. It may feel a little awkward, because I have a delta function. A delta function is 1 when x is 0, right? But this is going to come in really handy. So we're, I can think of it as summing over every student, but I only add the height. When, when the student is the Purdue student, and then I divide by the total number of Purdue students, okay? Now, um, okay, so y is the observed data, and x is the, is the un uh, unobserved data. So in general, these are vectors, so I'll index it by n. So y n is the observed data, and x n is the unobserved data, right? And x and y, if I don't subscript this by n, it means I'm just taking the entire vector. And I want to estimate the mean height of the student, theta. So here, theta, so theta might be, in this problem, so I'm giving you an example, theta here is going to be equal to mu0 and mu1. It's the mean for population 0 and the mean for population 1. Right? And they're going to be different. So this might be mu zero and this might be mu one. So I guess here we were taking the mean of the non produced students to follow the analogy. Okay? Is, is this really clear? Because this is important. If you get caught confused at this point, it'll be hard to follow what comes after this. Okay? So everybody if you ask if it's not clear, can you just ask ask me a question at this point? If some people are like looking in there, it's clear. Is it clear? Okay. Now, um, okay, so this okay, so this is the unobserved data and this is the observed data, right? And together, uh, why okay, so I'm not sure I want to write all over this, so I'm gonna you know write it right here. So y x together, this is the complete data. X, uh, okay, X, this is the incomplete data, right? If y and X together are complete, but if you have it, the problem is easy. If you have just Y by itself, the problem's hard. Now, you say, well, it's not hard, it's impossible, we are missing labels. No, it's not impossible, okay? Why? Well, the theory of estimation still works, okay? So, kind of like, let your mind float for a second and release all your inner tension and, you know, or whatever, and then think abstractly, okay? If I have any problem, why, I can use the maximum likelihood estimate to estimate any parameter theta has by maximizing the probability distribution of, of y given theta, right? So why can't I just apply this? It's simple enough, I just do it, right? Well, I can do it in principle, but it's a little complicated. Why? Because I have to write down the distribution 
of y, right? The distribution of y is going to be, okay, it's going to be the distribution of y x, I have that, and then I'm going to have to integrate that over x. And then that's the marginal distribution of this y. So this problem is hard, often, this is R max over theta, because I have to maximize an integral. If I can compute the integral in closed form, sure, then it's easy. But if I can't, then it's hard. Yeah. Uh, Professor, if it's only y is given, so when the mean be like the mean won't be mean, mean zero, mean one, there will be something mean will be in the middle of those two means. See, okay. So yes, you're asking a very good question. The mean of this overall distribution will now be the center, but that's not what theta is. Theta is actually the theta is a vector in this example, which is a vector of the two means. So what this is saying is for each value of theta zero and theta one, this distribution will have some form. It won't be unimodal. But and I can compute the maximum likelihood estimate of the observed data given this distribution. But this distribution is not complicated because it's given by uh, well, it's given by like well, it's fairly complicated. I'm going to write it down. It's given by a com a, a sum, actually a linear combination of the two distributions. But in principle, this formula still works. It's just that the answer is going to be really complicated. It won't be closed form. So doing the calculations, the beauty of the maximum likelihood estimate is if this is a Gaussian distribution, what's the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean? Absolutely. Yes, the average. Okay, so I want to point, this is actually, I, this comes back to what I was saying at the beginning of the semester. So I say a lot of things in this class that everybody thinks must not be very important, okay? And maybe they're not, but I think they are. Okay. <laughs> okay. So in the very beginning of the class, I said one of the fundamental things you got to get straight in your mind in this class, okay? It's the simple things in this class that are hard. The complicated things are easy, okay? So the idea is that the expected value of, say, y is the mean, right? But if I have a bunch of samples, the sum over n, the sum from i equals 1 to n of y n, this is the average. Average. This is the mean. Okay? The average is a random variable. The mean is a number. These not only are not the same thing, they actually don't come from the same group of things. Okay? They actually belong to different categories. They're not only not equal, like one and two are not equal, but they're at least both numbers. Okay? So I can talk about them being equal. This thing isn't the same thing as that, so I can't even talk about them being equal because they don't even, it doesn't make any sense. This is a random variable and that's a number, okay? So, um, the, law, uh, the law of large numbers says that the average often can converge to the mean in, uh, strong, uh, in probability or um, uh, almost surely, depending on whether you're talking the weak or strong law of large numbers, okay? So they're related but they're different, okay? Now, um, so the beauty is that if y is a Gaussian random variable, so y is, y n is i i d n zero or n mu one, okay? Then what's the maximum likely estimate of mu, the mean? It's the average. So the average is the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean for what distribution? The Gaussian distribution. It might be the it might be the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean for other distributions too. It is the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean for other distributions. It's the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean for the Poisson distribution. Okay. Okay, and it's. Uh, 
There are other distributions for which it's the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean. But in particular, it's the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean for the Gaussian. Okay? Not bad. Okay? So, that's why the average squared, that's one explanation as to why the average is a useful estimate of the mean, because it's the maximum likelihood estimate of the distribution of the Gaussian. Okay? Now, so the reason we like the Gaussian is that if once we know, if these are both Gaussian, but we just don't know which class the sample came from, then once we, if we had, we knew which class they were from, you could just sort it into the two buckets, right? So you have two buckets here. I'm trying to make this visual. So as each bucket came in, so this is a ball, okay? And as each ball comes in, maybe in this case we have two different types of balls, okay? We have the heavy balls and the light balls, okay? And then we put them in the bin. So if we sort all the heavy ones here and all the light ones there, right? Then there'll be some variation. You can weigh, you can weigh these, and you can find the app the mean weight, okay? And then you'd know the mean of the Gaussian distribution, assuming that there's some vari variation in the weight of the balls, okay? 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 But if they're all lumped together, if you put them all in a single bucket, well, that's a problem, right? Because they're not sorted. They're all mixed together. So then what you could do, but you could plot the distribution. There's some information there because you see this little bump, okay? And you say, hmm, this must really be two different distributions. So the way you're going to go about it is because but the machinery all works. You can still use the maximum likelihood estimate. It's just that computing it is hard because it requires this interval. Okay, so you have the complete data and the incomplete data. So how are you going to go about doing that? So is every is everybody got this idea then? So what we're going to actually do? I mean, in some sense, it makes perfect sense. Look, look, I could it, it, think of it this way. Yeah. So like, uh, you're a mechanical yeah. engineer, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So you're trying to estimate in the other page uh, to the oh, data. Okay. Uh, like. Underneath the two. Yeah. So here one? No, that's this one. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, we are trying to estimate the maximum likelihood. Oh, I forgot to turn my microphone on. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So the maximum likelihood of this uh, estimate of this theta y, mm -hmm. we are trying to estimate that uh, like that should be equal to uh, the maximum likelihood estimate of p theta y given x, right? Or Okay, say that again. Like, this thing should, uh, we are trying to estimate, should be equal to uh, the maximum likelihood estimate of y given x? Like that? No. Because we don't know x, but we are trying to get the estimate such that it equals the y given x thing, right? So, I think what you're saying, okay, so I'm kind of judging your question. So your question is a very good one. Okay, and your think thought process here is really along the right line, but you like learning the EM algorithm is a journey of self-discovery. <laughs> you first have to get confused about it a lot, okay, and then uh, someday you wake up and you go, oh, now I understand, okay. So I think you're confused, which is good because I think that's the confusion that I want you to have because then once you identify that confusion, you understand. I think what you're trying to say is this. You're saying, hmm, so I have y and I have x, right? But the problem is I don't have x. So I want to put an estimate of x in here. Is that what you're trying to say? You're sort of saying, well, I want to pick the best y theta I can for a given x or something like that. Ask your question again. So in other words, the, the tendency is to try to stick an estimate of x in here. Yeah, like something like what we were doing, like given x, like as you want distribution of x, something like that. The given x, but yeah. where would you get x? So I'm asking you, I mean, your questions are really good, okay? You're absolutely on target here, okay? The reason, I, so don't take what I'm asking you as a point of like, your questions are excellent, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm helping you to try to, you have to fully recognize that there's a problem before you can understand. It's like, you know, where they say. It's fine, I think you can go you, you see what I'm saying? So the problem is, is that this x here 
where are you going to get it from? So there's a variety of things you might try to do. One thing you might try to do is you say, well, I'll try to estimate x from y. But the problem is I don't have theta. So I can't really estimate x from y because I don't have theta. Okay? The other possibility is you could say, well, I could try to maximize over x, and then I could try to also maximize over theta. That's actually what we talked about in the previous section at the very end. This is sort of interesting and useful sometimes, but it's really wrong. Okay? <laughs> okay? This will give you an estimate of theta, and sometimes it will actually give you a useful estimate of theta. But it's wrong because you can't really, it's not the maximum likelihood estimator. The maximum likelihood estimator integrates out x so it marginalizes over it. Okay? And then while well, you say, well, why do we care about the maximum likelihood estimator? Well, because we know that the maximum likelihood estimator has certain uh, properties. First of all, it's, um, it's asymptotically efficient, okay, under some relatively weak assumptions. So that means it's asymptotically unbiased. It means it meets the kramer royale bound. It certainly is not inconsistent. If it was an inconsistent estimator, it could not be asymptotically efficient. Okay, see, in the world of estimation, okay, an asymptotically efficient estimator is like really good because it means that if we have enough data, it gets, it gets close, asymptotically close to the optimal estimator. There's nothing better. If n is large, there's nothing better than the maximum likelihood estimator. It's as good as you can get as n gets large, okay? An inconsistent estimator is all the way on the other spectrum. It's horrible, okay? It's like worse than terrible, okay? So over here you have inconsistent. Okay, over here you have maybe like, you know, um, you have some various bad estimators. Like, okay, uh, is, this could be, um, you know, uh, uh, it could be uh, consistent, but it could have a huge variance. And over here you have asymptotically efficient, okay, ML. This is a gray estimator. This estimator is horrible, okay? Because this estimator, the reason this estimator is horrible is because it says, it says no matter how much data I give you, I can give you a truckload of data, you will still give me the wrong answer. And then I can give you a Google truckload of data, and I'll still give you the wrong answer. You can give me an infinite amount of data, and I'll give you the wrong answer. Okay? This is a really bad estimator. It's like, yeah, it's just terrible, right? Because you're just ignoring the information. Mm -hmm. There's various organizations one might think of that would behave this way, right? So, so like, you know, like, you know, this is like a, a TV pundit, okay? <laughs> you know, you know it's just, you just always get the wrong answer, okay? It's like hardwired. So this is bad. You say, well, why is it so bad? Well, let's go back and look at this picture. Why is it bad? Because I could have, I could have an infinite amount of data. I have a, uh, a Google foot click squared of data, right? And this is the distribution. And, and the true means are here. Right? And I'm going to tell you the means are there. Well, maybe not that large, but like that, okay? I'm always going, that error will remain a fixed error regardless of how much data you give me. Okay? So here, here, here's another example. Let's say, I'll make it work. Let's say this is one distribution, and this is the other distribution. Right? So that they overlap really closely like that. So then the joint distribution looks like this. It's just a little flattened on the top, right? Then I'm going to put my mean in here, and then so the average will come here, the mean of the two classes will be there. But the actual means were right, right there. And you can give me an infinite amount of data, and I'll still give you the wrong answer. 
Whereas I know, for the maximum lifespan estimator, if you give me enough data, I should be able to get asympt um, asymptotically efficient, and the Kramer round bound efficiency of uh, variance will eventually go to zero if you give me enough data. So the one, so the, the ratio of the, the ratio of the error goes to infinity. Okay, that's why it's really bad. Okay, it's not just a little bit bad. It's not just biased. It's not like it's just off by. Uh, it's not just biased. It's like ignoring the data. Okay. It's ignoring it, the the weight of an infinite amount of data. Right. So. So, but the, and the distinction is this method that segments the two regions into the the lower and the upper. That's equivalent to this. Because for a particular assumed data, you're classifying the pixels as either one or zero, depending upon what seems more likely. Okay? That's this method. So this method is, is actually quite bad. It's very bad. Uh, once we uh, do identify the maximum likelihood estimate of uh, theta uh, from the distribution of y, how would we uh, basically separate the two, uh, two distributions that we would like to come to the mean of? Like, but it's in non in this case. I haven't given you the answer yet. So, so the answer is, how do I separate? You're asking me how do I separate? Yeah. So the answer is, that's what I'm going to tell you next. Okay. But the first thing I want you to understand is just that the naive way of doing it is wrong, and that there's a problem here because you really kind of need to separate them. I'll tell you what the answer is informally. Okay, and then we're going to derive all the equations. The informal answer is this, that instead of, the problem with this method is I make a hard decision. I say each student is either a Purdue student or not a Purdue student, right? Instead, what the solution is going to be this. I'm going to say there's a 10% probability this is a Purdue student, and there's a, or there's a 90% probability this is a Purdue student. But I will never say with absolute certainty because it's impossible to know, okay? And that's going to be the essence of the EM algorithm. What makes the EM algorithm work is soft classification, okay? But it's a formal method of soft classification that is guaranteed to converge to a local minimum of the maximum likelihood estimator, this thing here, without having to compute that crazy integral, because the integral is really hard to compute, okay? So, um, oh gosh, okay, so now, um, so this, you've got to read the notes, okay? Because I go through all this and I explain it from a different point of view, okay? So there are two classes, each of one is Gaussian. So the conditional distribution of y given x is Gaussian with the same standard deviation with two different means. This is page 155, section 8.1 1, of the notes. And uh, if x is zero, it's one mean, and if x is one, it's another mean. So one, I think, corresponds to the fertilized plant, and zero corresponds to unfertilized. So the fertilized plants, on average, will have higher, will be taller. Okay. So uh, and now there's also a probability of belonging to each of these classes. So so pi zero of the plants were unfertilized, and pi one were fertilized. Okay. Okay. Now. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so, so, okay, so this is the naive algorithm I said. I said, well, find the threshold. If y is greater than the threshold, you say it's fertilized. If it's less than the threshold, you say it's unfertilized. But that's sort of unfair. Because so you're basically assuming the result. You're saying, well, like, let's say I was an unfertilized plant. I was proud how tall I had grown, even though nobody had ever fertilized me. And then you said, well, you're tall. You must have been fertilized. You see, that's not fair. I should belong to the unfertilized plant, okay? So you can do it this way, where S0 and S1 are, are the two different sets. The sets you classify as 0 and the sets you classify 1. You use sum over those, okay? Okay, now... Um, uh, but the correct thing to do would actually be to um, 
the correct thing to do would be to actually uh, sum over x here. So x is actually discrete. So I can say integral. It's really a sum in this case. Uh, by the way, a sum is a special case of an integral, right? Because it, if you allow there to be delta functions here. Okay, so if you integrate over x, then um, then you get the marginal distribution of y, and you can do maximum likelihood estimation on this distribution as a function of theta, right? So, um, so you maximize this, and um, um, right. But the problem is how you do that. And here I describe the missing data is x, the complete data is x. Uh, as x and y together, and the incomplete data is y, okay? Now, okay, before I go and actually solve the problem, I want to at least write down what the, the distributions, the joint distributions are, and the marginal distribution is x in explicit form so you can see. So, okay, so this is the conditional distribution of y given x. It's just gaussian with mean mu's of xn. Now, this is important to understand. Uh, it's a little bit maybe counterintuitive for people who aren't used to dealing with it. That in the equation, so this is actually uh, the qu first equation of section 8.2. Mu sub xn is the mean with, uh, for class xn. So each class, xn is a variable, it's either 0 or 1, right? So you're going to have. Um, you're going to have mu, you're going to have mu zero, right? And you're going to have mu one. So if you have mu, oh, so if you have mu sub xn, what that means is the mean corresponding to the class that x has, right? That was kind of a weird sentence, but does everybody understand that? So x sub n is the class, so it's either zero or one, and then mu sub x of n is going to be that mean corresponding to that class, okay? Now, um, okay, so you got that. So the picture is like this. That uh, you have a bunch of random number generators. That each one generates a random number with a, a different mean and variance. Okay. Oh, here I guess. Hold on. Oh, oh, here I'm also making the standard deviation a function of x n. Same thing. Okay. So each, you have a bunch of random number generators. Each one generates independent, identically distributed Gaussian random variables, but with mean mu, mu sub k and, and variance sigma sub k, okay? And the mu and sigma are different for each k. So this is like uh, k equals 0, and this is k equals 1, and this is k equals m minus 1, okay? Or maybe I'm using the letter N here. I forget. Instead of K. It doesn't matter. It's just, this is the class number. Okay? So for each class, you have a different mean and variance. Now what you do is you have a switch. X sub N is the switch. And in each time, the switch moves to a random position. So it's like, you know, this switch spins around and it stops at some position. Okay? And it selects one of those, and that's the output. So it's a randomized commutator switch, okay? Does that make sense? And then y of n is what you actually observe on the output. So, okay? So that's called, y of n then is called a Gaussian mixture distribution. Gaussian mixture distributions come up a lot in a lot of practical problems. And actually, mixture distributions more generally come up a lot. So, if you want to write the distribution then for y sub n, all you do is you take the conditional distribution of y given n and you sum over the probability of each class n. So this is the marginal distribution for one of the y. And it just has this form. It's actually pretty simple. By the way, guess what that, that distribution looks like? That distribution looks like the picture we were drawing a few minutes ago on it looks like this. See, that's a Gaussian mixture distribution because it's the sum of two Gaussian distributions where you've weighted each distribution. Does that make sense? Are you okay with this? 
Ask a question. You make me feel better. Thinking about my application, but yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. Okay, so like for instance, you can also have this would be one Gaussian distribution, and maybe the other one's like this. Okay, they don't have to be equal size. So this might have total integral epsilon, and this would have integral one minus epsilon. They don't have to be the same size. They have to they have to integrate to one because the whole distribution has to integrate to one. This is a beautiful thing. Because you know why it's a beautiful thing? Because if I have any distribution, right? Guess what? I can approximate that distribution with a bunch of Gaussian distributions. I can put like a whole bunch of little Gaussian distributions over here. And I can fit anything with a mixture of Gaussian distributions. My, one of my professors in graduate school many years ago, who will remain nameless, told me that, said in our class, that you can't I think I've said this before. That, you, that in order to do anything useful, you have to assume the things are Gaussian. It really bugged me at the time, and I've dedicated my career to proving that wrong. Okay? <laughs> Perhaps unsuccessfully so. But nonetheless, um, yeah, you can model anything as a, a sum of Gaussian distributions. You know, it's a little bit like. If you have a nonlinear system, you can you can take a nonlinear system and model it as sort of a piecewise linear combination of linear systems. You can linearize it locally. It's the same sort of idea. You can locally model the thing as Gaussian and put a bunch of Gaussians together and fit anything. Okay? And that's why these Gaussian mixture distributions are so powerful. So um so okay, so this so does everybody believe that this is the distribution of the Gaussian mixture? And now, um, now what you do, okay, so you're going to read the notes, right? Because you don't read the notes, you won't understand anything. Um, so then, uh, um, uh, okay, so that's the Gaussian mixture. Now the other thing, so this is actually the distribution of just one variable. Now if in addition, you have you want the joint distribution of the entire sequence of y. Then you have to take this thing. Okay. Oh. Okay. So this is the distribution of this one variable. Okay. That's the yeah. distribution of one variable. And if you want the, the distribution of the sequence, then you have to take the product of the distribution of each of the independent samples. Since they're independent, you just take the product of the probability density. So you get this. Right. It's a beautiful thing to behold. By the way, when you're doing the EM algorithm, you'll get a lot of complicated equations. And everyone will look at them and say, oh my gosh, you must be a genius. But you know what? When you look at them, they're really pretty simple. You decompose them in your head, okay? Like, oh, okay, this is a conditional probability of a Gaussian weighted by this pi m, which is the probability for that particular component, sums over all the components, and then you just multiply them all together for each sample in time, okay? Does that make sense? Are you just yeah? Shouldn't like a uh, equation like a point to be multiplied with delta of x and minus it? Okay, which one? Uh, the equation a point two that is a point three, a point two, a point two. Uh, okay, we have this it? is just the the distribution of y n. So I overloaded this probability density. So uh, it, it, the notation is a little bit abusive because this probability density and that probability density are uh, that one are, are two different functions. These are two different p. This is p of y the vector, and that's p of y to the n the scalar. Yeah, okay. But uh, shouldn't equation a point two like shouldn't it have a shouldn't be multiplied with delta of x n minus n? Um, because uh, p of y n is p of y n given x. Now, um, it's a very good question. Okay. Hold on to that thought and I'll try to explain to you why. What you're saying is if I want the joint distribution of yn and xn, right? That would be exactly what you're saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be the joint distribution of yn given xn, right? And then times what it would be like is uh, uh, sort of pi, Xn actually, right? And then you could, I know what you're thinking, it would be sort of like K 
okay, well, yeah, I wouldn't even put it here, but I know what you're thinking, okay? But, but, when you, yeah, but now when you sum over all the xn's, right, um, you get, you get this. Because each state of xn is possible, so you're, you're marginalizing over it, right? This is, another way of thinking about it is this is the sum from n equals zero to n minus one of p of yn given xn times p of xn. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Is everybody clear on this? He asked a very good question, okay? Please don't be afraid to ask questions because it's a lot better if you ask them because I have a feeling you're all confused about exactly the same thing. It's just that you're all like, you know, nobody wants to admit it, but you're all asking the same questions, okay, in your head. Because everybody who goes through this the first time has the same points of confusion. Okay? So are you okay here? Now, uh, so, okay. Um, now, if you take xn, that you can express xn, the number of classes equal to m in this form. I wrote this already, right? And so a reasonable estimate of, of, of pi m is going to be this, okay? So if you actually observed x, if you had x, if you had the complete data, if you knew that x, then you would just compute this, and you compute this, that would be the fraction of samples that were class M, okay? And you compute the conditional mean, and you compute the conditional variance, right? Okay, these equations look a little complicated. These are the equations on page 159, they the end of section 8.2. But if you understand what they mean, they're so simple. And if you don't understand what they mean, you'll stare at them forever, okay? So let's just go through them. Is it clear? This is just counts the number of x's equal to some value m. Okay. This counts. This ca uh, counts the percentage of samples equal to m. So the percentage if 23 percent of the samples are of class m. Okay. What what would your estimate of the probability of being in class m be? 0.23, right? So, if, you know, if I if I ask you, well, what's the per, what's the percentage of the population that believes vanilla ice cream is good? You ask people if they like vanilla ice cream, and, and if 27, if, if 48 out of 50 people say they like it, then your conclusion is that 0.48 that the 96 percent of the people like vanilla ice cream, right? That's because that's the maximum likelihood estimator for the rate of a Bernoulli process. You did that in, sec in chapter two, okay? So this is the maximum likelihood estimate of, the, of, the, of that parameter, right? And this is the maximum likelihood estimate in the mean because you only summed it over the samples whose class corresponds to class N, okay? And this is the maximum likelihood estimate of the standard deviation. Then you say, well, okay, this is all very simple, and we're done. So why are we talking about this? We're talking about it because the hard part's going to be when you don't know X. If you know X, this is easy. If you don't know X, this is hard, okay? So what are we going to do? So in the next section, I'm going to introduce the mathematical machinery, okay? So the next section is important you try to bear with me, because the next section is going to seem very dry and irrelevant, okay? But it's going to give you the magical tools in order to get analytical solutions to these hard problems of solving maximizing estimation from non-complete data, okay? And if you really, really, really should read this section because it's very dry, and when I go through it next time, I'll try to make analogies, but you won't know what I'm talking about if you don't read this, okay? You've got to read it carefully first. They're very simple, elegant arguments, and you'll get a lot out of it, okay? But the beauty you're going to turn out is that, uh, okay, I'll switch to uh, rear projector, okay? The beauty we're going to find out next time is that we can, by, by at each step, computing the expected probability that X is from a particular class, 
And using the expected probability to compute weighted averages of samples, we can then get an iterative process of getting the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters. And my timing is perfect. <laughs>